Hello, 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 and welcome to the inaugural episode of The Castro Files. Hey, honey. Hi. I am Beth Lamontane. This is my husband, Greg, Greg Lamontane. Lamontane. And um, we're excited to do some new stuff for you guys with some great stories, some scary, some creepy. mysterious, some creepy, fun, entertaining kind of From all over, things. right? From like Absolutely. all over the world is what our goal is. That's the goal. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. what's in it for the listeners? Since this is the first one we've done, right? What, what do you think is in it for the listeners? Um, hopefully just some fun and some creepy. eerie, goosebumpy yeah. uh, feelings from these stories. You guys probably get away maybe, from your day to day. Maybe some of you have had some creepy stories. These are stories that are often called like evergreen stories where, you know, they're what is evergreen. Mean? Evergreen is basically they, they're tried and true. Like they've okay. never, so, they've yeah. been around for a long time. So sometimes we'll, we'll come up with our own stories or we'll have our own stories. Right. And we have those from time to time, but we'll also stories have stories that others are have some shared of our favorites that we've heard. Oftentimes on maybe other podcasts or we've heard the stories or we've gone, you know, you've read about them and stuff like that. And we want to definitely share that with you guys. So the whole purpose of this is we love creepy stories. We do. We love creep. Like we love creepy paranormal. movies, paranormal yeah. stuff, shows, tours. Anything basically we can get our hands on is kind ghost of, hunting. We do it all. We, we like try it. and do it all. And we've been to some pretty creepy places. Right. We were just recently up in New Braunfels, stayed at a creepy place, went to a creepy bar there, the Phoenix Haunted Saloon. Saloon, correct. You know, and we've stayed in Estes, what is it? Um Estes the Park. Stanford Stanley Hotel. Stanley Hotel. Hotel. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's basically that kind of thing. It's really fun. We love this stuff. And so we figured, we figured if we like it that much, we may start bringing some to people who like it too. It with you guys as well. So yep. we're going to go over. Generally, we'll have maybe one or two stories. Maybe Depends on the story. Time, a third or something like that. Yep. But yeah, try and creep each other out. Try and find some of them. One, the story I'm going to tell tonight is called The Watcher. Mm -hmm. It is one of the it's a great story. creepier stories. It's a, These are longer format kind of like creepy stories we've heard this one before and it creeped us both out yeah, yeah. and it's it it literally is one of my favorites yeah. what's your story tonight mine is about a ghost called betty um it's called betty and it takes place in um odessa which is west texas okay um so i've got i'll share some of that stuff awesome yeah when we get there so who's starting tonight you are babes i'm starting tonight yep. all right so cheers thank you guys so much for joining so these are stories that other people have written. So we're definitely going to give credit to the writers. Correct. The story that I'm going to read tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, is from the New York. It's off of the cut.com. And the writer is Reeves Weideman. Um, So you ready? I'm ready. All right. This is from November 19th, 2018 is when this story was written. So. One night in June 2014, Derek Brodus had just finished an evening of painting at his new home in Westfield, New Jersey, when he went outside to check the mail. Derek and his wife, Maria, had closed on a six-bedroom house at 657 Boulevard three days earlier. That's the address. If you Google that address, you're going to find more info. pictures. Yeah. Okay. Here's a picture to give you reference. If you're listening only on the audio version of this, which it'll be out on iTunes and all stuff, I'll post all the pictures out. So this is six five or six eight seven. No, six five seven Boulevard. It's pretty house. Yeah, very pretty. So they closed on the house three days earlier and were doing some renovations before they moved in. So there wasn't much in the mail except for a few bills and a white card-shaped envelope it was addressed in thick clunky handwriting to the quote-unquote new owner and the type note inside began warmly dearest new neighbor at 657 boulevard allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood kind of i mean normal okay. so far Kind of yeah. not normally people come over with like. Well, maybe they're just shy. I mean, it's not abnormal like a, as of yet. A fruitcake or something, maybe. Right. 
right? Probably. Keep going, bro. This goes. For the Brutuses, buying 657 Boulevard had fulfilled a dream. Maria uh, was raised in Westfield, and the house was a few blocks from her childhood, childhood home. Derek grew up working class in Maine, then moved his way up the ladder at an insurance company in Manhattan to become a senior vice president with a salary salary large enough to afford a $1.3 million house. Was no cheap house. Nope. The Brutuses had bought 657 just after Derek celebrated his 40th birthday, and their three kids were already debating which of the house's fireplaces Santa Claus would use. Okay. Cute enough. But as Derek kept reading the letter from his new neighbor, it took a turn. Question from the writer. How did you end up here? Did 657 call to you? With its force within, the letter the letter went on. The, the author's reconnaissance had apparently already begun. The letter identified the Brutus's Honda minivan as well as workers renovating the home. I see you I see that you already have flooded 657 with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it was supposed to be, the person wrote. Tis tis tisk. Bad move. You don't want to be you don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. Earlier in the week, Derek and Maria had gone to the house and chatted with their new neighbors while their children, who were five, eight, and ten, ran around the backyard with several kids from the neighborhood. The letter the letter writer seemed to have noticed. You have children. I've seen them. Cool. Okay, now that's creepy. So far, I think there are three that I've counted, the anonymous correspondent wrote before asking if there were more on the way. Do you, do you feel the need? Uh, do you need to fill the house with young blood I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for the growing family, or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them, and I will draw them too. Okay, now it's getting not kind of weird. Pretty, so pretty this flippant story, weird. again, is it's creepy. It is creepy. This is a real story. True story. Yep. The envelope had no return address. Who am I? The person wrote. There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look out any of the many windows in 657 Boulevard at all the people who stroll by each day. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm one of them. The letter concluded with the suggestion that this message would not be the last. Welcome, my friends. Welcome. Let the party begin. Followed by a signature typed in cursive font, The Watcher. It was after 10 p.m. when Derek Brutus was alone. He raced around the house, turning off all the lights so no one could see inside. Then called Westfield Police Department. An officer came to the house, read the letter, and said, The fuck is this? <laughs> Seriously? All right. He asked Derek if he had any enemies and recommended moving a piece of construction equipment from the back porch in case the watcher tried to toss it through his window. I mean, okay, certain things. Right. Derek rushed back to his wife and kids who were living at their old home elsewhere in Westfield. That night, Derek and Maria wrote an email to John and Amanda Woods, the couple who sold them the house, to ask if they had any idea who the watcher might or or who might be or why he or she had written i asked the woods to bring me young blood and it looks like they listened oh i didn't hear that part in the letter so he literally said he asked the people living there prior to bring in young, young blood. blood okay andrea woods replied the next morning a few days before moving out the woodses also had received a letter from the watcher their note had been odd she said or had been odd, she said, and made similar mention of the watcher's family observing the house over time. But Andrea said she never had a she and her husband never had received anything like it in their 23 years of living in the house. And had thrown away the letter without much thought. That day, the Woodses went with Maria to the police station where Detective Leonard Lugo told her not to tell anyone about the letters, including their neighbors, most of whom she had never met. And all of whom were now suspects. Okay. Makes okay. sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, basically. <clears throat> I mean, you're calling yourself the watcher. so many people, And they're catching all these right, things that are happening. Around you that you're like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The Brutuses spent the coming weeks on high alert. Derek canceled a work trip. 
And whenever Maria took the kids to their new house, she would yell their names if they wandered to a corner of the yard. Like, get back. Billy, get back here. Yeah. When Derek gave a tour of the renovation to a couple on the block, he froze when the wife said, it'll be nice to have some young blood in the neighborhood. This is... Very, people. very uh, the similar is, to the letter. Yeah, exactly. The Brutus' general contractor arrived one morning to find that a heavy... Uh, that a heavy sign he'd hammered into the front yard had been ripped out overnight. Two weeks after the letter arrived, Maria stopped by the house to look at some paint samples and check the mail. She recognized the thick black lettering on the card shaped envelope and called the police. Welcome again to your new home at 657 Boulevard. The watcher wrote the workers here the workers have been busy and I've been watching you unload carfuls of your personal belongings the dumpster did the dumpsters a nice touch have they found what is in the walls yet in time they will this time the watcher had addressed derek and maria directly misspelling their names mr and mrs Bradis. miscorrectly spelling their name had the watcher been close enough to hear one of the brodises uh, it's brodis uh brodises okay yeah, as opposed to Bradis. right Contractors addressing them, the watcher boasted of having learned a lot about the family in the preceding weeks, especially about their children. The letter identified the Brodus's three kids by birth order and by their nicknames. Oh, creepy. Somebody's close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You have to think so, it's like the general vicinity. So, like, literally, you're like, ah, do I be nice to these to people? Hear, or are there bugs in the house? Are there microphones yeah how are they getting this information yeah, right like yeah. how do you get that like if i were to call you castro right and then the somebody city, the castro files, right like how do you, how do people know that i mean you call it out pretty loud but it's people but it's only certain people that right. really know something like that right so you certainly uh say their names often the letter asked about one of the children in particular whom the writer had seen using an easel inside the enclosed porch she an artist in the family the letter continued 657 Boulevard is anxious for you to move in. It has been years and years since the young blood ruled the hallways of the house. Have you found all of the secrets it holds yet? Will the young blood pay in the base, uh, play in the basement or are they too afraid to go down there alone? Yeah, now they are. I would be very afraid yeah. if I were them. It's, it is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Will they sleep in the attic or will you, will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. It will help me know who is in which room. Then I can plan better. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move in the house. Who am I? I am the watcher. And I have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of th two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move and kindly sold it when I asked them to. I passed by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life, my obsession. And now you too, Brodus family, welcome to the product of your greed. Greed is what brought you or brought the past three families to 657 Brodus. And now it has brought you to me. Have a happy moving day. You know I'll be watching. I just got the chills, dude. That's creepy. I just got the. I just got literally got the, got the willies. Chills. I got the willies. I literally just got the willies. <laughs> Imagine that. Nope. Fuck. Derek and Maria stopped bringing their kids to the house. They were no longer sure when or if they would move in. Several weeks later, a third letter arrived. Where have you gone? The watcher wrote. Six five seven Boulevard is missing you. Sorry, many of the residents of uh, many of Re Westfield residents compare their their town to Mayberry, the idyllic settling setting for the Andy Griffith show. Like this shouldn't necessarily happen. Westfield is forty five minutes from New York, a bit too slow for singles. Meaning the town's thirty thousand residents are largely well to do families. families. So it's pretty close. We were talking about some of this stuff earlier, right? right. Um, the Watcher. Uh, there's some other websites and stuff like that that have tracked this over the years and they nobody to this day knows who it is right so we'll get into this here the letters did indicate proximity they had been processed by uh, processed in kearney the u.s postal service 
uh, Postal Services Distribution Center in North New Jersey. The first was postmarked June 4th before the sale was even public. So no. somebody knew wow. that that house was being sold to that they was under contract before it was even public because huh. you know how that goes. Yeah. The Woods had never even put, put up a sign for sale. The only day, uh, the and only a day after the contractors arrived is when they put up, put it up for sale. They were doing work on it, renovating. Why would you the, put it for sale if it's already sold? Well, they were renovating. Oh, the old owners sorry, were renovating, yeah, the not the is, new owners. Yeah. Okay. Right. The, the renovations were mostly interior. The people who live nearby say they didn't notice any unusual an unusual commotion, even from jackhammering in the basement. When Derek Maria walked Detective Lugo around the house, they showed him that the easel on the porch was hidden from the street by vegetation, making it even more difficult to see unless someone was behind the house or right next door. There was no angle that you could see just from walking. the front of the house. Yeah, just walking. Right? Mm -hmm. A few days after the first letter, Maria and Derek went on, went to a barbecue across the street, welcoming them and another new homeowner to the block. The Brodices hadn't told anyone about the watcher and the police had instructed as the police had instructed and found themselves scanning the party for clues while keeping tabs on their kids who ran guilelessly just going to have have had yeah, their big fun, kids through the crowd and made up such um, that made up such a, made up much of the suspect pool. We kept screaming at them to stay close. Maria said people must have thought we were crazy. At one point, Derek was chatting with John Schmidt, who lived two doors down, when Schmidt told him about the Langfords, who lived uh, who lived between them. Peggy Langford was in her 90s, and several, sev several of her children, all in their 60s, lived with her, which is a bit odd, right? Right. Schmidt said, but harmless. He described one of the younger Langfords, Michael, who didn't work and had a beard like Ernest Hemingway's okay. as a kind of Boo Radley character. Yeah. Derek thought the case was soft. The Langfords house was right next to the easel on the porch. The family had lived there since the 60s when the watcher's father. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah. When the watcher's father, the letter said, had begun observing 657. So that family had been there since the 60s. Okay. Right? Watcher's father. Presumably. Okay. The fate. Uh, so Richard Langford, who was the watcher's father, the family patriarch had died 12 years earlier. And the current watcher claimed to have been on the job for a better part of two decades. Timelines kind of match up. Right. When the uh, Brodus is told Lugo about the family, he said he already knew. And a week after the first letter arrived, he brought Michael Langford to the police headquarters for an in interview. Michael denied knowing anything about the letters, but the Brodus say that Lugo told them this, uh, told him that the narrative of what he said matched things mentioned in their the letters. Letter. Hmm. This isn't CSI Westfield. Lugo told the Brodus says, when the wife is dead, it's the husband, right? Generally yeah, speaking. It, most, Generally yeah, speaking. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not all the time, but sometimes, right? But there wasn't much hard evidence. That was the problem. After a few weeks, the police chief told the Brutuses that short of an admission, there wasn't much the department could do. This is someone who threatened my kids, and the police are saying probably nothing's going to happen, Derek said. Probably isn't good enough. After the second letter, Derek told the cops that if – they didn't take care of the situation that they would have a different kind of case on their hands. This person attacked my family. And from where I'm from, if you do that, you get your ass beat. Right. Right. Like even if you come at me, I'm, co I'm, go I'm, I'm coming back. Yeah, yeah. Right. Frustrated. The Brodices began their own investigation. Derek began, uh, especially uh, became especially obsessed. He set up webcams at six, five, seven, uh, Boulevard and spent nights crouched in the dark watching to see if anybody was watching the house at close range. Could you imagine that? Like, just looking out of every window. Nope. Trying to see, like, lights off. Right. Just watching to see if somebody's coming, like, walking by. Like, how, like, come on. Hmm. Right? Marie thought I was crazy. Uh, he told me recently at a coffee shop in Manhattan where he covered the table with documents relating to the case, including copies of the letters, which he found he and his wife found, uh, I'm sorry, he and his wife had shared with only a few friends and family members. He showed me a map displaying when each of six, five, seven neighbors had moved in. The Lankfords were the only ones there since the sixties. 
with overlaying markings, po uh, possible sight lines for the easel, and a circle of approximate range of earshot to estimate who might have heard Maria yelling their kids' names. Only a few homes fit the uh, fit the criteria. The Brodises also turned it turned to several turned to several experts. They employed a private investigator who stalked uh, staked out the house ran background checks and on, on the Langfords and didn't find anything noteworthy. Derek reached out to the former, to a former FBI agent who served as in, as the inspiration for the Clarice Starling the, oh, yeah, in the, the silence of the lambs, yeah. right? They were on high school boards of trustees together. And they also hired Robert Lenaham, another former FBI agent to conduct a threat assessment. Linham recognized several old fashioned ticks in the letters that pointed to an older writer. Okay. The envelope was addressed to M slash M Bratis. The solutions or the salutations included the day's weather, warm and humid, sunny and cool for a summer. And the sentences had double spaces between them. The letters had a certain literary uh, panache, which suggested a, Voracious reader, like you, like me. You're always trying to correct me on stuff. And surprising lack of profanity given the level of anger, which Lenahan thought meant a less macho writer. Maybe he wondered the watcher was had seen the had seen the watcher starring Keanu Reeves as a serial killer who stalks the detective trying to catch him. Oh, okay. Lenahan didn't think the watcher was likely to act on the threats, but the letters had enough typos and errors to imply a certain erraticism. The first letter was dated Tuesday, June 4th, but that day was a Wednesday. There was also a seething anger directed at the wealthy in particular. The watcher was upset by new money moving into town. Are you one of the Hoboken transplants who are ruining Westfield? And by the Brutuses, relatively modest renovations. The house is crying from all of the pain it is going through. You have changed it and made it so fancy. You are stealing its history. It cries for the past and what used to be in the time when I, ro when I roamed it, when I roamed its halls. The 1960s were a good time for 657 Boulevard. When I ran from room to room, imagining the life which, with the rich occupants here, the house was full of life and young blood. Then it got old. And so did my father, but he kept watching until the day he died. And now I watch and wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again. Yikes. Lenahan re recommended looking into the former housekeepers, the descendants, anybody that was connected with this house. Right. But the focus remained on the Langfords, the next door neighbors. Right. Right. In cooperation with, with, with the Westfield police. The Brodus has sent a, le sent a letter to the Langfords announcing plans to tear down the house, hoping to prompt a response to kind of egg them on. Right. Right. And nothing happened. Detective Lugo brought Michael Langford in for a second interview, but got nowhere. And his sister, Abby, accused the police of harassing their family. Eventually, the Brodesses hired Lee Levitt, a lawyer who met with several members of Langford family, as well as their attorney, to show them the letters, along with photos explaining how their home was one of the few vantage points from which they could see that easel right. on the, you know, in front of their house. The meeting grew tense, Levitt told, uh, Levitt told me, and the Langfords insisted Michael was innocent one night, and one night Derek had a dream in which he confronted Peggy, the eldest Langford, and demanded she built an eight-foot fence between the properties. Maria was having other kinds of dreams. One night she woke up to an especially vivid one about a man who lived nearby. He was wearing these boots and carrying a pitchfork and calling the kids and calling to the kids. And I, and I couldn't get to them in time. Maria said she, she thought almost anyone in, could be the watcher. So it's starting to get yeah. psychological, right? Them, right. Starting right. To wear, Starting to wear at them. them. Right. Yeah. So she probed the faces of the shoppers at Trader Joe's to see if they looked strangely at her kids or her and to spend hours Googling anyone who seemed suspicious. Okay. Which I would do I too. I mean, yeah. I'd be like, I would literally be Googling everyone in the neighborhood. Oh, you'd be, be like, crazy. Who's this person? Who's this person? We already have cameras all over our house. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah. on those things all day yeah. long, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just gotta be like, what? There are reasons to consider other suspects. 
For one thing, the police spoke to Michael before his second letter was sent, which would make sending two more, especially sending two more letters, especially right. uh, reckless. The brothers has said that the that Lugo told them that they wouldn't receive any more letters after he spoke to Michael. Then there was a re- then there was the rest of the neighborhood to consider. The private investigator found two child sex offenders within blocks. Always scary. Right. Bill Wood Woodard Woodward. The Brodus's house painter had also noticed something strange. The couple behind 657 Boulevard kept a pair of lawn chairs strangely close to the Brodus's property. One day I was looking out the window and I saw this older guy sitting in one of the chairs, Woodward told me. He was facing his house. He was facing, I think it was a mistype. He was facing his house. He was facing the. He wasn't facing his house. He was facing the Brodus's. So okay, so he wasn't out. looking at his house. He was looking that. Yeah, way. Okay. but by the end of 2014, the inv- investigation stalled, and the watcher had left no digital trail, no fingerprints, and no way of placing someone at the scene of the crime, so to speak. The renovations to six five seven, including a new alarm system, were in, were finished within a few months. But the idea of moving in filled the Brodus's with overwhelming anxiety. Dread. Seriously, yeah. Could they let their kids play outside or have friends? Friends over? Would they get a new letter every week? Derek priced out trained German shepherds and posted a job on a website for military veterans. All you have to do is work out in the backyard every day. Just work out in the backyard. You yeah. just wanted some level of security right there, right, right. I, mean, that would I just need sense. you to be around just be around and just work out yeah i don't give a shit what you do right but the Brod- book. do whatever just be a big Knit your scarf person and yeah. just hang out right yeah but the brutuses hadn't bought 657 to feel bunkered in a fortress at the end of the day it came down to what are you willing to risk maria told me we weren't going to put our kids in a in harm's way derek had uh, we weren't going to risk our putting our kids in, Der- in harm's way. Derek had been responding to the occasional alarms at the house, sometimes in the middle of the night, bringing a knife with him just in case, because they're still staying at the other place while they're right. doing all these renovations, right? right? Mm-hmm. They, were, they were so joyous about their new home, and then within days, they were petrified. Yeah, that would suck. I'm a stranger, and Maria was crying and shaking at, uh, in my arms. It didn't help that the watcher seemed to be getting more and more unhinged. 657 Boulevard is turning on me. So letter is, from yeah, the watcher. The watcher. It is coming after me. I don't understand why. What spell did you cast on it? It used to be my friend and now it's my enemy. I'm in charge of 657. It is not in charge of me. I will fend it, fend off its bad things and wait for it to become good again. It will not punish me. I will rise again. I will be patient and wait for this pat for this to pass and for you to bring the young blood back to me 657 boulevard needs to be needs young blood it needs you come back let the young blood play again i once did let the young blood sleep in 657 boulevard stop changing it and let it alone the young blood thing here is creepy and he does sound totally like it's changing on me it's yeah, coming after it's me it's definitely changing it's creepy. Yeah. All right. So the Brodises had sold their home, so they moved into Maria's parents while continuing to pay the mortgage at the pro- and property taxes yeah, right. at 657 Boulevard, right? I had to do things like shovel the driveway, you know, just picture that indig- little indignity. They couldn't, they weren't living they there. They were taking care of it, were, but they weren't living they there. They were just, they were like property managers, but right. no... Rent tenants, they needed right? to get tenants. Said, I was so depressed. I was a depressed wreck, Derek said. Maria decided to see a therapist after routine doctor's visits that began with the question, how are you? Caused her to burst into tears. The therapist said she was suffering uh, post-traumatic stress that wouldn't go away until they got rid of the house. Six months after the letters arrived, the Brodus's decided to sell 657 Boulevard. They initially listed it for more than they paid, to reflect renovations they had done, but after but a few worlds, but few worlds are more gossipy than suburban New Jersey real estate, and rumors had already begun to swirl about why they why the house why the house sat empty. One broker emailed uh, to say her client loved it, but there are so many unsubstantiated rumors flying about. Right, 
ranging from sexual predators to stalkers that they need to know more. The Brodices sent a uh, partial disclosure mentioning that letters to interested buyers and told Coldwell, Coldwell Banker, their realtor, that they they intended to show full letters to anyone who off, uh, whose offer was accepted. Several preliminary bids came in well below asking price, but the Brodices weren't ready to take such a financial hit, right? Yeah. So, Buy it for over a million bucks. Like right. You sold it. For, you bought it for one point eight. You don't really want to take seven fifty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So my friend got a horrible threatening. Oh, let me go back. A Coldwell agent who hadn't read the letter letters told them uh, in an email that they were being unnecessarily forthcoming. My friend got a horrible threatening letter letters about her dog barking, and she didn't think to disclose. But the Brodus's insisted. I don't know how to, how you lived through what we did, and think you could do it. Uh, do it to somebody else. I don't know where that came from. Well, the, the 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 agent saying you don't have to because it's true. Oh yeah, yeah. You don't have to. Like I got horrible letters because my dog barking, but right. I didn't tell that to the person who moved in after me. You know, I mean, it's like, what are you gonna do? Like, right? Tough shit. Like, we have dogs, mm -hmm. right? But the Brodus's felt that the name alone was ominous enough to merit mentioning to a. To the to a new family that they were moving that we're moving in. I'm sorry. Let yeah, me but go the back. family before them didn't mention they got a letter. Right. So yeah, exactly. Derek and Maria thought about what they were. I, I skipped yeah, a paragraph. Derek and Maria thought about what they were would have done had the previous owners told them about their letter. Exactly. From the watcher. That's what I just said. The That's crazy. Woodses, both retired scientists, told the Rodas's that they rec uh they remembered the letter they received as more of a strain as more of strange and threatening think uh thanking them for taking care of the house they say that they never had any issues we certainly never felt watched andrea told them and they rarely even locked the doors but the brodices felt the name alone was ominous enough to merit mentioning to new family moving in and on june 2nd 2015 after a, a year after buying uh, six five seven Brodus's. They filed a legal complaint against the Woodses, arguing that the Woodses should have disclosed that the letter, just as they had the fact that water sometimes got into the basement. So they should have. Right. It's kind of like, like some states you aren't required. They, to tell you're them, not like, like if, if somebody, somebody passes pa away yeah. in a house. Phoenix, Arizona is one of them. It was right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and like if you have to you do your due diligence on the house. Kind of got to do a yeah. little homework, yeah. right? It's kind of it's. You never know. And if, right. if you're if you're not comfortable with that, like you almost need to like build a new house or something. Right. If you, you know, don't want like, any history in your house. Yeah. In like some places in Texas. Do a, or do a here, new build or yeah, you know, custom like, or just, rebuild. I mean, a new build or custom yeah, or whatever. Like you see the picture. That's an older house, yeah. right? It's a great go, house, though. Yeah. Maybe maybe there's some history to it. Maybe yeah, you want to know, right? So basically, the, the Brutus has felt the same, like I said. Um, they filed legal complaint. Like I said, mm -hmm. the Brodus say that they hope to reach a, a quiet settlement. Their kids still didn't know anything about the watcher and their lawyer assured them that at most a small legal news wire might pick up the story. Well, it's gone viral, viral yeah. global, right? It's all over. You can find this story everywhere. They, they eventually rented the property out. Okay. And, it it continues. There haven't been more stories about it, right? But when you go into it, and that you know, anyone's talking about, anyways. Yeah, and it just it's one of those stories that I've 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 thought about, and it it's come so up several times. They've never found out, right? They, like nobody still knows. And they never got day. any more letters when they started nope. renting well, it out after after they got it from here. Yeah. Okay. They couldn't find. They did all sorts of DNA analysis on the letters. They did right. fingerprints on. There was nothing. There was nothing. Yeah. So it says they were the Brodus's were stunned. They had recently told the prosecutors that they plan to file civil charges against Langford's, the next door neighbors, like, but nothing ever, ever came. They, they, get they didn't have anything. No, yeah. yeah. There's no suspects left. So you go, like, who were the people watching? Well, and did they have cameras outside? Like, wouldn't, I mean, okay, first thing I'm going to do, right, is like, if you can see my house, like as well as I can, I'm going to literally walk around and be like, how can you see this? Where can you see this? From? I'm going to put cameras. I'm going to put cameras in but every we... angle where you cover. But here's the thing. So those things cover our houses. They don't face the street. 
So you don't see what's happening in the street. You see what's happening to your house. Like, but like those cameras, what I'm like saying the is, though, like they put this in the mailbox. But wouldn't you expect to see like something on a tree? Like a camera, like a watch. Yeah, some, I see what you're saying. You, I get what you're saying. That person's not physically there, but they've established right. cameras. There's got to be some, that allows them to like, see at the this house. Is like James Bond kind of right. stuff. Right. But at the same time, though, from my perspective, if I have cameras on my house, which if I got these letters, I would totally put one on my mailbox yeah. and be like, okay, who? Every day, every day, I'm checking 24 hours worth of that that's footage. What, that's why they end up having PTS and stuff like that, post traumatic stress, because you're like, where? How are they? Right. How are they? I've got watching? to find this. Yeah. Like, are they in my Wi-Fi? Are they in my sis? Are they in my? Security? Are they looking at me through my own laptop like, camera? You know, like you, you want to like. There's a laptop over here because obviously we're doing the show. Right. But you're like, do I put the sticky? Like notes even on over... your iPads and shit, yeah. they all have cameras how where hackers in... can get into and see what you're you doing. Know? Yeah. And if they've been doing, so it's so years. sad. They never lived there, huh? Did they yeah. finally sell it? Um, I didn't. As of this one, it didn't say. Let me scroll. Hang on one second. Because yeah. we know they got the renter. They had upgraded the house um, from, let me see. Some locals found it noteworthy that over the course of a decade, the Brodus has upgraded from a $315,000 house to seven hundred seventy to a one point three and refinanced from mortgages. They were just, other people are digging into their backgrounds and stuff like that, right? Um, but it doesn't necessarily say what ultimately say, happened. Yeah, in here. If you dig if you if you pull probably the story, you can find it. Yeah. Some uh some people, you know, question it is is it like a ploy right. to draw more people to in, the house? To like make it creepier something. than it was. But why would the prior owners have had that letter? Like a, right. any letter. Why would they have gotten a letter at all? Right. Right. If they were the if they were the instigators of this new creep right. factor, why would, they why would the old ones? One? But just, but here's the question. Did they already know they were going to buy it? And could they have sent it to those people when they still lived there? Now there's that, right? you know, but if I remember correctly, like they did a pretty extensive investigation yeah. into the family like, and ruled them. That, I mean, that, they ruled them. No, like they weren't involved in any way yeah, other than yeah. being the center of the attacks, if you will. Yep. So it's it's very interesting. Hmm. Go check it out. Six five seven Broadmoor. You can Google it. It's all over the place. Nice. You can find it. Very so cool. creepy story. One of those ones that we heard coming down from Colorado on Scared to Death podcast. Or one of them. Some, was one of who death, it was scared to death, like but and I'll post the link, of course, at the <clears throat> once we post out the show, I'll post the link to the story. You guys can dig through it yeah. more. There's there's a lot. It's thirty eight pages long. So it's a lot. Um, I think yeah. that was a good story for a first episode. It's creepy. What's yours? Yeah. What's your story? Uh, mine is not nearly as long. But yours is just, it's interesting. It is interesting. It's a Texas story. It is a Texas story. So it is an article I found about a ghost called Betty on Sword and Scale, which was written on June 14th of 2017. All right. In my research, though, I did find that there, it's a big enough story that like the um, Texas Monthly also right. did an article on it. So, I mean, it's it's got some some publicity going. So at, um, at Odessa High School in West Texas, stories of the ghost of Betty William circulate wildly, gathering momentum with each new year and high school intake. The school's auditorium is her was her favorited place where she once was a student and a flourishing actress dreaming of Broadway success. Faces appearing in windows, flickering lights, strange noises, and objects that mysteriously move are all attributed. Oh crap! What I do? Um, are all attributed um, to the presence of Betty. For those who don't know the tale, there are myths of how Betty died from innocent accidents at the school to onstage theatrics that went horribly wrong. But the truth is much more grisly. So um, on March twenty second. 1961, 17-year-old Betty Williams disappeared. She had gone to bed as usual as for her parents knew, uh, for, as for her parents knew, but come morning, Betty was gone. A friend of Betty's, Ike Nail, had driven her home from a drama rehearsal the night before, as he told police, dropping her off at her house around 10 p.m. Betty had asked him to return an hour later and met her in the alleyway behind her house. 
He duly complied, and Betty climbed into his car dressed in her pajamas, telling him she had sneaked out of her house and without her parents' knowledge. So she'd snuck out. Okay. Um, there is a picture that I sent you. Yep, it, they didn't come through. I it's also okay. texted it to you. I know. Um, of Betty and her the, uh, Betty and somebody else. I'll post some. I'll post some so videos. Betty Williams grew up in the suburbs of Odessa with her parents and three younger siblings. Her father was a carpenter who was deeply religious, a Baptist to warn his daughter about sin and damnation and worried greatly about her direction in life and her chosen behavior. Betty Williams liked to stand out from the crowd, enjoying antics that gained her attention and allowed her voice to have her opinions. Although confident, Betty was a young girl who wanted acceptance amongst her peers and would watch the popular, wealthy, and beautiful girls enjoy their parties, gatherings, wishing she too would be invited to join. This is one of those. So yeah, they sounds like Back to the Future kind of like old school. What, what year was 1960. this? Nineteen sixty. Yeah, this is 60, definitely like nineteen. Back to, when she so came up was, missing, it was um sixty one. Okay. Um, let's see where was I? Okay. Uh, in 1960, she began dating Mac Herring, a local boy who attended the same school. Mac was a boy who fitted in with the crowd, a popular member of the school football team. He grew up in a more affluent area of town than Betty and was a fan of hunting, often spending his weekends out with his rifle. Mac was a sophomore and Betty was a junior when they first became friends and when their relationship turned romantic, Betty seemed to have fallen hard for the new boyfriend in her life, but Mac ap appeared hesitant to fully embrace her. He didn't invite her to parties he didn't tell his friends about her. He didn't advertise the time he spent with her. That's Betty weird. embarked on a liaison with one of Mac's friends, something Mac discovered uh, and wasn't happy about. Soon he called the romance off and started a relationship with another girl already in the popular circle. Oh, so, so she was the, was she the nerdy girl? She was the dirty secret. Uh, no, in the article, other articles I read, she wasn't the nerdy girl. She was um, There's less picture. affluent. I, I just can't find the picture right. She time. was less affluent. She was a little bit more wild okay. in her ways. Um, uh, so, you know, she was kind of more of like a a pariah, if you will, in that time. Which sucks. She was just there to have fun and hang out. Right. She's like, I want to party, bro. I, yeah, I just want to. Right. Back then, but. Betty became a teen on a downward spiral, devastated over the loss of her boyfriend and feeling deserted and alone. At the time in her life, nothing seemed to be going right for her. She did not get a part in the school play when a new drama teacher, Betty felt, didn't see her potential and assigned her backstage instead. On the top of her woes, at school and in her personal life, her home life had become strained after her father discovered her diaries, which gave all the details of her sexual experiences with boys. Things a father does not want to read about his teen daughter, and certainly not a father who felt behavior was simple. He, he in a diary. Was, he was snooping. He was snooping. Oh, fucking. Stop snooping, dads. You don't want to know the dirty, creepy stuff your kids do. I, I mean, at certain age. Right. That's what I'm saying. And the weeks before her appearance, like if she's nineteen, stop Logan, dude. Yeah, well, if she's nineteen, maybe she should be writing it in a diary. I think that that was Instagram uh, it, back in the day. It's man. it's back too. Right? People, I mean, people, have, people have people have diaries. People do all sorts they have, of weird they call them journals now, but people still do it. Oh, that's in the is. weeks before her disappearance, Betty Williams began making comments to her friend about dying, leaving this world, and being in a better place. She told them she oh. wanted to die and would take her own life if only she had the courage to do so. There were comments her friends did not take seriously. They collectively gave them little thought, believing they were jokes or simply comments to gain attention. Betty's expressed her wishes to end her life were laughed away, but they were wishes she intended oh, to carry man. out. That's sad. On the day Betty Williams disappeared, police brought in Mac Herring for questioning yeah. after the statement made by Ike Nail saying he saw her last Who going named, in. These, these are old school yeah. names, like Mac and Ike. Yep. Yeah. Mac, like told, Greg. Mac told them he picked Betty up that previous evening, but had driven her back to her parents' house around midnight, and that was the last time he'd saw her. His story was inconsistent with small details that didn't ring true, raising the suspicion of in the interviewing officers. When questioned, when questioned harder, he broke and told them the, stro the true story that they could hardly believe. Okay. I'm ready for this. Okay, hold on. I gotta take a sip. Take a, take a, take a little sip. Because I'm, I'm thinking... I'm thinking... Well, just wait. Don't think right. out loud yet. Okay. Mac Herring had shot and killed Betty. Sorry. Mac Herring had shot and killed Betty Williams because she had begged him to. He took the police to a stock pond in a secluded spot on the outskirts of, of the city located on some barren land. Okay. He told police he had shot Betty, 
weighted her body down, and let her sink to the bottom of the pond. At the location, Mac himself went into the water and came out dragging her body. On, on examination, it could clearly be seen that Betty Williams had been shot in the head at point-blank range. <sighs> Mac told police Betty was delighted that he had agreed to kill her. Last thing she said to him was, give me a kiss to remember you by. Yeah, that's right. Not they, cre- What? Betty was delighted that he agreed to kill her. I heard you. Give me a kiss to remember you by, he said to her. Sorry, I left that part out. He said to her. So he asked her to kiss him so he could remember her. Uh, they kissed, and when she pulled away, she told him now. Matt Caring raised the shotgun and fired, killing her instantly. Dude. <clears throat> There's another picture of the article, but we'll put that up. Yeah, we'll, we'll post up. Okay, so let's recap real quick. Yeah. So he's saying that she asked him to shoot her in the head because she was sad. She was, yeah, she was tired of her life. Yeah. How old is she at this point? She was a junior. So 16, 16, 17. God damn, dude. I don't believe it at all. Well, hold on. The murder of Betty Williams and its circumstances dominated the headlines in 1961, with many horrified that a young girl wanted to die and her ex-boyfriend had agreed to kill her. Young children at the time grew up hearing the stories of Betty and the rumors that her ghost now haunted the school. Yeah. When they entered the high school themselves, the myth resonated further. You would hear door slamming, you would see curtains move, and nobody was there. One student, Kylie, said, you would just hear things. As with all good ghost stories, there are many tales that encounter or many tales of encounters with Betty. I remember hearing later on she was a ghost and I knew who it was tied to, another student shared. I think that people have seen an image of her in the halls. It's creepy, right? Mm-hmm. Do you, so is this a real like This is real. This is a real story. Yeah. Okay. You're, I'm, I'm about to Okay, you're gonna give us sorry. This is a good one. Yeah. This, this is a really good one. Yeah. I don't say this actually. It's a really good one. It's when it came to the picture. criminal proceedings against Mac Herring, yeah. everyone expected expected an open and shut case. He had murdered a 17 year old girl, girl in cold blood and admitting to doing it, taking police straight to her body. Letters written by Betty Williams, however, were found after her death. Letters where she explained her torment and her agreement with Mac Harrington to kill her. Okay. As I have only the will and not the fortitude necessary, she had written, I pray that he will not have to suffer for what he is doing for my sake. I take upon myself all blame for it was lie for it lies alone on me only. Fuck. Really? Mm -hmm. And those came after. Okay. So, but was it, or they found these letters? Like we need handwriting analysis. We need all of the stuff, right? Like, is it her cursive? Cause back in the day, everybody wrote cursive, right? Thank Was you. it her handwriting? Um, the trial of Mac took place at Winkler County Courthouse in Kermit, Texas. Jeez. Mac's parents hired defense attorney Warren Burnett to defend their son, who they were adamant was temporarily insane at the time he shot and killed Betty Williams. The murder by now had been dubbed the kiss and kill murderer by the media, and the tension of the case was huge. Whoa. On February 19th, 1962, both Warren Burnett, which was his attorney, and Dan Sullivan for the prosecution gathered in the courtroom. As far as Sullivan was concerned, this was premeditated murder and he would be pushing for the death penalty for the now 18-year-old Matt Caring. Reporting... Texas, yeah, we have the death penalty here. Reported in a book on the case, Washed in Blood, written by Betty's cousin, Shelton Williams, in a surprise move, Barrett did not enter a not guilty plea for his client. Client. Instead, he introduced an affidavit from Mac Herring's father stating Mac was insane at the time of the killing. Okay. His plan was for the court to move to a sanity hearing whereby jury would decide on sanity of Mac Herring at the time of his murder and not of his guilt or innocence. Okay. A verdict of insanity would mean Mac Herring would not be taken to trial for murder. It was a defense strategy, strategy that had never been done before. Oh, it's the first time an insanity yeah. plea had been used? Yeah. For in a murder. The local reaction was mixed. Many made crude comments about Betty Williams. They said she was promiscuous and had manipulated this poor boy into killing her. Others felt regardless of her behavior. That way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you hear those things about kids that bully people on Facebook that somebody telling them they should be dead, they should kill themselves, and she did. And that person. He murdered. 
Well, he, like he or she. I thought it was she. She kind of egged him on to commit suicide. That's right. That's it was her boyfriend or something. Situation. And there's a movie about it yeah, now. Yeah, it's super sad. But, I mean, it's like, holy shit. Yep. Right? Others felt, regardless of her behavior, Mac Herring had taken the decision to kill her and carried it out under his own free will. Damn. When the sanity trial commenced, the letter that Betty Williams had written before her murder was presented as evidence. I mean, that's kind of huge. Yeah. Burnett called her friends to the stand who testified Betty had told them she wanted to die and she had asked many of them to kill her. Okay. So he wasn't her first. Um, his final witness was a local psychiatrist, Dr. Hmm. Marvin Grease, who testified that Matt Carrington was suffering from gross stress disorder at the time of the killing. The stress on him from Debbie, uh, Betty repeatedly asking him to kill her had affected his ability to reason, he told the court, and therefore he did not know what he was doing when he shot and killed her. On, 20, on February 24th, 1962. Okay. Real quick. Yeah. Keep the 1962 there. Um the insanity thing, I'm like, it's not. It's it's a different. It's temporary I think it's just insanity a strategy. But I'm like, how do you go insane in like? Well, if she'd been bugging him for weeks on end, which we don't know how long she was asking him right. to do this. I mean, if she was asking her friends, she was probably asking him at the same time. By maybe, yeah, I don't know. Like, you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to. I need you to do this. I need you. I'm begging you, don't you love to do me. this. You don't love me. You don't if you love ever me. cared about me. Imagine that you would make me Holy you would shit. you would do what I'm asking you to do. 1961 was and they're great. kids. Yeah, you know you don't know. So how old was he again? I'm he sorry. was younger than her. He was a year younger than her. Okay, so she was 16, 17. He was, she was 16, 16 15, yeah, 15, 16, 16, 16 yeah. somewhere around there. Oh, that's creepy. It's not creepy. It's just crazy. So on February 24th, 1962, the jury returned their verdict. They found Mac Herring innocent of murder, uh, innocent of murdering Betty Williams on the grounds of temporary insanity. So it worked. Yeah. Excuse me. Little Did you have to go to a, a, an insane asylum? I think I don't think so because they said temporary insanity. Uh, yeah. So he's got his yeah. wherewithal back. Yeah. But it. it doesn't say. It does say that little was known about Mark Herring after his trial, but the stories of Betty's ghost continue in and around Odessa High School. Whether or not she really did want her ex-boyfriend to end her life, or if it was an attempt to gain his attention and hopefully his affection, once again, we'll never know. Hmm. The myth of her spirit roaming the halls and in school auditoriums where she loved to be is something her friends say would have pleased her. There's a part of me that kind of laughs and thinks Betty would have loved that she made her mark. So when I was looking... Yeah. Um, and I told you there was a Texas Monthly. So yeah. there were mm -hmm. the kids, what they do is they drive up to the school and they park in front of the auditorium. And apparently um, they sit there to wait and see the ghost of Betty. Okay. And according to legend, she would appear at the window of the school auditorium at midnight, provided that the students flashed their headlights three times and honked their horns and called out her name. So we should try it. We got to find this is in Katy, Texas, right? No, Odessa. Odessa. Yeah. Okay. Odessa, Texas. I was thinking, no, that's a different, that was a story we did the other yeah. night. Sorry. Um, yeah. So they do say, like, and there are, like most ghost, stor ghost stories, there are different things that people say, oh, she fell off a ladder putting up something for a play okay. and she fell and broke her neck. Or, you know, there's a bunch of other uh, tall tales that go along with her death, but mm -hmm. really, literally, this is what happened to her. It's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. And I could see how, because she could haunt the school after that. Yeah. That was like her important place. Absolutely. So, so it doesn't do say, and, and and the kid was, the kid was really good looking. Like they show his. Oh, I wish, I'm sorry. They show his the pictures. Right um, yeah. Like the day that he won the trial, he's very, very handsome. He's handsome. Um, he's bloke. hugging his mom probably after they came back with the verdict of not guilty. Yeah, I'll post um, pictures out to You but, can check us out. The dot castro.files yep. on Instagram. Follow the YouTube channel. Yeah. The Castro Files. Subscribe I'll and post like us. All that out there. You can follow it. What do you guys think of these stories? They're creepy. And you can send us stories. If send, you know yeah, creepy absolutely. stories. Yeah, if you know of something, you come send across them, send them, stories. send them. Yeah. We love hearing. We love reading, talking about creepy yep. stories. We've, we've traveled all over trying to find like cool things in Jerome, Arizona and like said, Flagstaff and uh, up Estes in San Park Francisco. and San We've Francisco. Done a lot of cool yeah. 
Alcatraz. We even did the Alcatraz one. Yep. You know, years and years ago. So yep. lots of cool stories out there. Thank you, honey. That was an awesome one. Thanks. Week. That was fun. This is Beth's show. Well, it's our show. It's our show, but it's your show. It's just because it's titled. The name me. is The Castro Files. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight, listening to a couple of uh, creepy, creepy stories. Creepy, ghostly right? stories. Hope you guys enjoyed them. We'll be back on, we're, we're debating on when to drop them, but I think we're going to do. We haven't decided yet. I think. You're pushing for Sundays. I'm pushing for Mondays. We'll, we'll figure it, it we'll out. Test the waters. But we will be back with another one in a week. Next week. Yep. yep. So cheers. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. It's been awesome. I love you, honey. I love you, baby. It's fun. Let's keep telling scary stories. Keep getting freaked keep out. Keep it spooky, Keep peeps. it creepy. See you later. Bye, guys. Cheers.